Fuck me, that wind's cold, cock, and it's a westerly. Well, good afternoon, Mark, and uh, thank you for having me down today. I think it's a good job we rescheduled this session because last time it uh, we had about a foot of snow, didn't we? We did, Joe. We're um, and speaking as a northerner, we're deep south, but I seem to think that we've had more snow in the deep south of England rather than the north of England this year. So I think at least we've got it's wobbling and it's uh, five degrees and uh, it's not what you would call February weather. I'd actually, being 300 years old like I am, I would say it's more akin to April weather. So without setting myself up for a fall, Joe, I think I might catch one for the camera. It's looking perfect pushing in here. You were telling me a bit about this lake and that it's not typically a good winter war, but obviously weather conditions are a bit more on our side. But uh, tell us a bit more about the water itself as well and the stock and how you've done so far. Yeah, to be fair, it's... Um it's a newish water, and when I say newish water, I think it's only been sort of excavated about eight years, and the uh, uh, indigenous fish that were in here, I think, have nearly all been taken out because they were predominantly coarse fish. It's been stocked, I think Ben stocked it, I think, six, maybe seven years ago, um, and I think it's probably three and a half, four acres in size, shaped like a boomerang, a couple of islands, well, no, one, two, three, four islands on it. Um, and you've got a, a stock of probably 40 to 50 carp. And the average size now, Joe, is very, very healthy. I think the average size is probably about the 30 pound mark. And the biggest fish in here is, um, it's not been out at 60, but I think if we're very fortunate and we do catch it, it's gonna be very close to 60. Last time it was out was 59, 10 or 59 12 and there's another 50 in here um fish called single scale um and i've been very fortunate enough to catch that i've not had many fish um uh, to be honest with you joe because obviously as i mentioned to you off camera um it's 148 miles one way from my front door so it's a it's a fair old trip to come for an overnighter um so I've not been doing much fishing since I, I kind of pulled off November and I'd only started in September. But I'd been, I'd been very fortunate. I'd had the second biggest fish, single scale at 51.12. I'd had uh, uh, another 40 odd fish. Um, and I've had, I think a 34, 37, 38, a 35. So I've been very fortunate. I think I've had about six or seven runs and again, I've been fortunate in that I've only lost one fish. And the natural tendency here is because it's so weedy and so shallow, you can lose them. So I've worked really hard at trying to uh, keep the uh, run ratio to landed fish quite high. Perfect. Well, uh, it's looking spot on now. I think we'll enjoy the rest of the evening. The weather tomorrow is going to get nice and sunny, so I'll... Uh I'll rattle uh, through some questions tomorrow at you when it's a bit warmer and nicer to be out in. But uh, fingers crossed something happens for you tonight as well. Certainly I'll be trying my best, Joe. Well, good morning, Mark. I think uh, yesterday we uh, may have jinxed you about how warm it was because today, although it's gloriously sunny, it's much cooler, much more uh, February-like weather. So it didn't quite happen for you last night, though, did it? No, it didn't. It was, um, we had a nice time, a nice cup of tea, nice chat, and uh, all the convivial side of carp fishing that I don't normally get because people who know I'm very uh, antisocial on the bank <laughs> tend not to uh, uh, go in for the social side, but um, no, on the weather front, it was it was quite bizarre, really, Joe. We um, 
We had great conditions during the day, it was overcast, um, superb sunsets. Um, I know we got some lovely footage of the sunset and what a beautiful, beautiful lake it is. So to be out in it was great, but the serious side and what we try to do all the time when we do this is catch fish, didn't happen. We had um, a clearing of the sky about eight o'clock. Um, strangely enough, the uh, south south southwest south wind still was blowing, so we had a, a little bit of a blow on and I was reasonably optimistic. Then about 10 o'clock, it, it sort of fizzled out and um, you could literally have read a newspaper the sun was that bright, uh, the moon was that bright rather. Um, so it, um, it went into this morning and it was very cold this morning, Joe. We didn't have a frost, but uh, we certainly had uh, an air frost, I think. And it was a um, cold old start. And we, we sat here now. It's sort of mid to late morning, sun's high, high pressure, low temperature. So we're going to have um, a little bit of a rethink. I think we're going to have to go for uh, I like shallow water, strangely enough, when it's high pressure and this time of year. So I'm going to um, have a change of the spots, get the rigs out and uh, hopefully uh, see if we can get a daytime one. Now spots is also something I've noticed. That a lot of people fish to features that you can see and, and sort of read lines and things. You're actually fishing in the reeds as well on one of your rigs. So what's the whole idea behind your location and, and sticking one actually in the reeds? Yeah, it's a very... Um, Again, I don't want to sound like um, an anorak when we talk about rigs and position of rigs, but what I've found on small waters, and this is a classic example, this particular lake is, I don't know, three and a half, four, four acres. But what, it, what, you, what you get with, with small lakes is that if I can do the analogy on my hand, if you put a bait there, you will get a bite. If you put a bait there, you won't get a bite. What I mean by that is that the carp, are very much creatures of their environment and they get very spotty and used to certain spots on smaller waters. On large waters I've found if you can get the location where you actually are on fish then the actual ability to put a bait to a fish isn't as important. Whereas in a small water and particularly this time of year when the temperature is low where they're not moving about as much looking for food, then you've really got to think very hard about a particular spot that you're fishing. So to go back to your analogy, the reason why I'm fishing in the reeds is when I got here yesterday, I saw one large fish actually sat in the reeds. And if you think about it realistically, what, why would a fish be in the reeds? Well, there's a whole host of reasons, and one of the most important ones is the temperature difference. This lake, I took the temperature yesterday, was five and a half degrees, the water. The temperature in the reeds was seven and a half degrees. And I know it sounds daft, you might say, well, what, what's two degrees different home to? Well, if you put it in that analogy, you know, it's, it, it's, it's 25, 30% difference. It does make a difference. They will go in there and they will block stack, which is an expression that I've used where they get very close together. And sometimes they will let the weed and the reeds collapse around them. If you've got reeds like Norfolk reeds and bulrushes on here, you will get gaps in there. And very much with the increase in temperature where fish will go, you will also get the remnants of the natural food in there as well. So they've got a natural larder, they've got security of the environment around them, and they've also got a slight increase in temperature. So why wouldn't you put a bait there? Now here's the problem that we've got. How can you present a bait and still be fishing in weed and reeds? And I'll hopefully show you a little PVA trick, which I've been using for a lot of years now, which means you can be fishing in a small area in the reeds. It hasn't worked so far, so that, that kind of flies in the face of success. The fact I'm telling you this is what I'm doing, I've not had a bite yet. But I think that that is one of our best chances. The other spots, are not the same. I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I've got one in the reeds, I've got one in a depression, and I've got one up close to the reeds. And I think that when you see the tactics that I'm using, you can see that there's methodology behind it. 
most of the people who, who, who know Mark Holmes and see Mark Holmes and read my stuff that I've done over years will know that I'm a thinker. Now, I do accept that to some people, you can overthink it. And I mentioned to Joe earlier today that sometimes you can go cat fishing and they seem inordinately easy to catch and you'll throw something at them and you'll get a bite instantaneous. Other times they'll seem difficult. My own fishing approach, because it's what I like to do, is to try and think outside the box and come up with tactics that are a little bit different than people. And the one thing that I always say to the many people that PM me for messages about how they do this, what about this, what about that, is don't be afraid to fail. And if you are different and you do something that is a little bit quirky, then two things are going to happen. One, you will fail miserably, without any shadow of a doubt. But secondly, and here's the one that doesn't happen too often, you will succeed. But here's the big advantage. When you succeed with a new method, you get them all. You don't get crumbs off the table, you get them all. And then people will see your method, they get the crumbs off the table. So that's why I keep doing these quirky things to try and keep one step ahead of the fish. But more importantly, when I occasionally get it right, I want to catch all the fish. So Mark, just take a, a little side step away from this session. You've recently joined the uh, Shimano Isolate Baits. And uh, where did that come about? Because you've been with a, a different company for a long time, but why the change? What's the involvement and, and reasoning behind it? I think it's a complex question, really, uh, Joe. I, um, whether it's an age thing or not, I don't know. But there's two things that, 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 that are important as to my decision. One was I don't get bored, but I like to keep doing new things. I like new challenges in my life, and I think that that's because it keeps me fresh. Knowing your nature is very important in fishing, as it is in life, and my nature is to be driven. That's why I'm a campaign angler. I'll pick a particular target fish, and I will fish to catch that till the end. Well, it's the same with my own fishing. Um, uh, I like new challenges, and to be open, the Shimano thing came at the right time. I won't say that I was stale with my old bait company, but I'd reached a point where I was starting to feel as though maybe it was a good time to uh, go do my own thing or, or, or move away from, from being overly corporate. I wanted a new challenge. And Shimano came along, um, sold it to me in such a fashion um, that I knew that really, very much like in general life, if someone gives you an opportunity and you don't take it, I didn't want to be sat there in 10 years thinking, you know what, I should have taken that opportunity. So it was timing, it was right for me, and it's something that got me excited. And it might sound a little bit twee, and I don't want the viewers throwing up, but um, uh, when I get excited about a project, and I believe in a project, and I've got uh, my mind focused on that. That's when Mark Holmes performs at his best. Well, just to dive in a bit more deeper into what you just said, what, what exactly is your role within the bait company? Well, again, one thing that gets labelled at me a lot is that I, um, uh, I'm, quite, I'm quite reasonable at media. Um, I suppose that that's the inherent salesman in me. Um, but more importantly, um, I, I do get a little bit annoyed when people go, oh, he's got the gift of the gab or whatever. Being good at medium, being good at talking to people and being able to get your point across is a skill. And um, uh, it's something that I, I've worked out very hard over the years. And I get um, uh, uh, particular um, uh, satisfaction out of being the grassroots connection. So my role with Shimano Isolates bit is to get across the point to grassroots anglers. Um, those are the lifeblood of what we're doing. 
people who are out there, got busy time schedules, families, all the rest of it. Those are the guys who ultimately I like to think that um, we're going to care for. Um, instead of a small elitist clique where we talk about this and talk about that and keep it secret. No, 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 no. We want to spread this to the masses. So my involvement is first of all to get the words and presentation across of what the Shimano Isolate bait is technically, but more importantly, how you can apply it to your own fishing. From the R&D side, I'm involved with the actual development of the range. And that means, Joe, um, if you think about bait as, a, 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 as more than a one-dimensional boiler, I can talk about boiler, fat content, protein content, ash content, um, forever and a day. But a lot of it would go like that over people. The developments that we have already started since I joined the company is add-ons to what we've already got. So we've got the new range, which we are, um, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which is um, it in the shops at the beginning of March, um, uh, uh, which has been thoroughly R and D'd. But on the back of that, we're now researching and development on the liquid side, on the pellet side, on the ground bait side, as well as new boilies. So you can see we're not just simply going down the road of isolate bait being a particular boiler pellet liquid no it's a complete range and I'm a very conceptual type of guy I believe if you buy into a concept then you can expand on that concept and this thinking outside the box that I've been um, labeled with for a few years is a classic example that that is a simple statement but it has a far-reaching um, boundary so it can be rigs it can be waters it can be bait it can be tactics can be applying those tactics. Well, it's the same with the bait range at Shimano. What we're doing is we're extending that bait rate to include lots of different products that all come under the umbrella of Shimano Isolate. Exciting times, and that's basically why I think that uh, the next two or three years, we're gonna see some incredible products being brought to the market that I'm biased, but I think will, like I've shown in the past with other products that I've brought, and other tactics that I've spoke about will set the standards for years to come. So we've just talked about the uh, isolate bait range and, and your involvement there, but you also talk a lot about liquids. What sort of things do you do in your own fishing to, to uh, utilise liquids? Um, again, that's a very um, short question about a very long answer, so I'll try and um, make it succinct and to the point, but it's difficult, Joe. Um, think about it realistically. Um, when I do my slideshows, I have three slides that I think are very important. One is a boiler, one is a paste, and one is a liquid. And I always say, boiler, least attractive. Paste, reasonably attractive. Liquid, very attractive. And why do I do that? It's simply down to solubility and dispersing in the water column. If you think about it realistically, we are we needing something that we can put on an air or put on a hook so we can put a hook in a fish. You can't do that with liquid, but there are various stages in between that you can. Um, so liquids play a massive important part in my fishing and I've done for a long, long time simply because they attract fish far quicker than the ingredients in a sealed unit, which is what a boil is and the paste is like um, a halfway out of the two. But liquids are important in my fishing simply because they will bring fish to your hook bait far quicker than freebies. So how do you utilise them? Again, difficult question because there are probably 20 different answers and those 20 different answers appertain to the um, ecosystem of the lake you're fishing. Example. I fish a lot with liquids that leak from the bottom to the top and that probably is a conundrum for most people. Most people think of a liquid hitting another water column and instantly on that liquid hitting the water column it dissipates in the water. Well that's not good for fishing unless you're fishing on the surface. What you want is to flip it upside down 
and have it so the liquid goes down like a stone and then starts leaking upwards. So in order to do that you have to work hard on, on things that people don't think of such as viscosity. The actual thickness of the liquid is very important. If you want a liquid to sink like a stone then you need something that's got that's quite globule and quite has got quite a solid mass to it. If it's very weak and wishy-washy as soon as it hits the surface it's going to disappear. So in order to work with those liquids you need a vehicle to get it to the bottom and then leak from the bottom to the top. How you do that is the edges in fishing. One of the edges that I showed last year which I'd used very well was to mix your liquid with silver sand. Not build a sand, not sand from your kids play pen, not sand from Morecambe Bay but silver sand and there's a very good reason for silver sand it's because it's inert. Now without sounding like your old chemistry teacher that basically means it takes nothing on it's not absorbed so it's just a vehicle of which to get the liquid from the top to the bottom without leakage and that's done by use of, of a, a bait dropper or a spawn. So if you think about it realistically You've got your, you've got your um, uh, uh, spawn, you put your silver sand in and you pour your liquid and you close it and out it goes into the pond. Sand goes down like a stone, as soon as the sand goes down the liquid starts leaking off. Fish move into the area, they ain't going to eat the sand because it's inert, it's not mixed with the liquid. And this is the important part of fishing with liquids, make sure that you are very careful in how you mix it. Classic example, I see people mixing it in ground bait, I see people pouring it over boilies, I see people putting it over pellets. You get activity, you catch a few fish, you get in line bites. How do you know what is pulling the fish into your swim? Is it the pellet? In other words, the lump of food? Is it the liquid? Or is it something in between? Is the liquid catalytic? which mean has it been used to something else that's changed the makeup? All these are the imponderable things and these is where you've got to be a little bit smart. Think outside the box and try and not bastardise a product and use it by itself so that you can evaluate it quickly. It's a little bit like mixing lemonade and mixing blackcurrant juice. You drink it and you like it, but what are you liking? Are you liking the blackcurrant? Are you liking the lemonade or are you liking them both together? So you talk about the liquids being a key factor to bringing the fish into your swim. So how much emphasis do you put on your hook bait? Well, again, this is the important part about my own fishing. If you work purely and simply on an hook bait approach, you will catch fish and you will catch lots of fish but and there's the big but if every time a fish picks up a bait and it's a hook bait then you're only going to catch it once maybe twice now some might say well I only want to catch all the fish once maybe twice and I'll go to another lake and I tend to be a little bit like that because if you work hard on just tinkering with your hook baits you're educating the fish every time you catch it and put it back. So what you have to try and do is make the scenario where your tactics bring fish in and the hook bait is an announcement of that. I don't want to be too obtuse with my answer here, Joe. What I'm basically saying is, yes, I do tinker with hook baits, but it's done with another tactics that, that brings fish in. Everybody knows about my tactics with pre-spawning carp, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, at shows this year because I keep getting asked about it, how salt will attract fish. Attracting fish into your swim is one thing, getting them to take your hook bait is another different ball game and you've got to think of the two in tandem. You've got to think of what I call the cake principle and the cake principle is simply the cake's there with the cherry on top and your hook bait is the cherry on top. People come in and usually 
they'll come for the cake and they'll take the cherry and eat it first. That humanistic analogy makes it simplistic, but it's that type of thing. There's preparation gone around on the spot and the carp comes in and I usually want my hook bait to be the cherry that gets taken first. Right, um, you recall that Joe was asking earlier on about um, liquids and how you apply them on the bank and to your fishing situations and I'm a little bit obtuse when I was speaking about cherry on top of the cake so put a bit more meat on the bones, let's have a look and show some uh, products that we're working on uh, and how you can use um, uh, different liquids to create different situations. I mentioned earlier that my main emphasis this last few years is to be very clear with the water column, what I'm trying to do with it. If you leak the water, sorry, if you leak the liquid from the top to the bottom, then you'll move the fish up in the water. And I don't want to do that. I want to try and hook them on the bottom. So I'm looking for a leakage that's upside down where it leaks from the bottom to the top. Um, with the liver products, we're working on a liquid that you can add to it and you can see quite clearly there. If you look at that, and I'm sure Joe's zooming in, you will see, you know, there's your lid for it. And press it down, give it a good shake round. And you can think that it is simply, look at all that, you can think that that's just boilies in a glug type thing. So when they go in the water, you know, they're gonna wash off very, very quickly. Now then, you can see Quite clearly here, we've got some that have been in lake water of, of four degrees for probably, I don't know, two or three minutes now and you can see the water's still clear. The leakage is very slow. So if I drop a couple more in, drop one in there, and drop another one in there, you can quickly see that there's not a massive leakage of liquid straight to the top. Now what's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is that it's actually now a liquid that's working for you over a, over a longer period of time. So this isn't something that washes off quickly and that's basically where you can add it into your fishing situation and know that you are attracting fish into the area over a longer period of time. And let's not kid ourselves, we're fishing for fish that aren't always the easiest to catch and aren't always on your bait within two minutes. So you're looking for something where, which has got longevity from a bait application point of view. And that quite easily simplifies it. And this is, this is actual liquid. There's one more thing that I'd quickly like to show, and that's it going down in, in the water column. This is the um, liver that, is, uh, that, that we're currently working on. And uh, mm, nice, tastes like liver, but again, if you watch it, in, if, if I can ask Joe to come and look at this bucket and I will pour something in, again you will get a very quick idea. There it goes, you see, straight on the deck. One final thing about the liquids, you can see lake water plays an important part of my attack with liquids. It's overstated but lake water is absolutely vital and it has to be the lake water that you're in. You can see the liquid that I'm using on the boilers, if, if, if Joe can zoom in, can you see? How already the liquid and the lake water are separate. That's because it's lying as a sediment. Now watch as I mix it up. So I'll bring them out and you can see. And look now the lake, now the water has mixed and it looks all the same. But you can see quite clearly that within that liquid, can you see the lumps of liver? There you can see it clearly on my glove. So although it's a liquid, you can see that from the fish's point of view, there are food parcels in there as well. So it's not just a liquid that has no globules of food. There's plenty of globules of food in there. And I would always, always suggest to people that that line of approach is something that they should think of when they come to a fishing for big fish. Here's a rig which I developed 
and tinkered with for quite a while. Um, it's a method where I'm using um, a wafter bit, um, but I want it with no tubing on. So you can see it's quite a long air because I want the actual hook to be going into the scissors as opposed to the bottom lip. What the key to this is too, the hinge points are very, very important. There's obviously the hinge point there, which is just above the hook, and that's to allow it to move in many different motions, and so it can go back on itself without tangling. But here's the little key to this. You can see, I'll move my fingers out of the way, the air is quite a long air, there's no tubing on the hook, and the coating of the braid is pushed up, so if I pull it down, you can see, I'm pulling the coating down now and stripping it out. So you see, that's the full coating. I don't want that. What I do is, I tease it up there, so that you've got the flexible part and the hinge point, can you see that? The hinge point is just in line with the bottom of the shank. And what that basically does is that kicks it out away from the hook, so that when you get ejection of the bait, you get separation. I see a lot of liner liners and the like where they're completely fixated on a hook turning. I'm not so much bothered about that. That's not the key to this rig. What I'm looking for with this rig is separation, but I'm looking for separation where there is a distance between the hook and the air. If I was to strip the air completely of that coating, there's a very good chance that it could tangle in flight and you could have a situation like that. We see it so many times where the actual bait sticks into the point of the hook. With this still on the hair, it kicks it clean so you can see that the separation point is at the hinge there where the coating has been peeled back. So there's the full rig and I use it in conjunction with a PVA bag which I'm going to show you now how to put on. So I take the little anti-tangle tubing off in typical Blue Peter fashion is the um, PVA little ball already. I tend to have um, quite a few different types. They look the same, but trust me, they're different. You've got a PVA bag with boilies. You've got a PVA bag with crushed boilies and pellets. And you've got one with both of them in there. The reason why I use two different types is dependent upon the descent that I want. If you want a quick descent in quite deepish water, then I go for the boilies. If I'm fishing where there's weed growth and we're, even though we're in February, this sounds crazy, but we've got a lot of silkweed. If um, uh, uh, Joe can panther the silkweed, you'll see it growing on top of the existing weed. In those circumstances, I want a very feathered entry and I would go for the crushed boilies and the particles, which is this particular animal. And that's the one I'm going to be putting on. So I'll put those two back. We'll get our large baiting needle. What we'll do is make sure that our boiler and the hook is as dry as can be in the circumstances. Put that down there. Let's get it. We want it in the hook into the softer part. So I just go straight down the middle. There we go. So put it on. The old latch on. Push it through. There it goes. And keep hold of it for now. Oh Christ. 
You want to tango sleep? Do it goes. Push him down. So there it goes. Now then, what I like to do here is I don't like to bury it too far. I like to lay it in just like that. So you can see that that's how it's going to go down when it hits the deck. So we now put it on. My little rig. Push him up. Light leads, and that's the rig that we're using. Well, Mark, unfortunately, the uh, session, well, your session's going to carry on, but I've got a shoot on in a second. Hasn't quite happened for the cameras this time, but uh, still been enjoyable to be out and for this time of year, February weather. It's been uh, much warmer than we expected, but we are getting towards the end of February, coming into uh, March, April, and the beginning of May. What sort of tips would you give to people moving into this time of year for bait application and, and sort of um, approach-wise? As we said earlier, it's getting more and more difficult to, to answer that kind of question, Joe, because the seasons seem to be getting pushed. So whereas we would get an end to winter and spring would definitely arrive March, invariably you'll find that the, the sting in the tail of winter comes about March and April. So what my, my advice to people would be, first of all, don't overbait, which is one that people often speak about, but I often see people still falling, over, or falling into a, a pit and putting too many boilies out but try and work on attraction this time of year and try and work on attraction that disperses in the water column quickly and that falls very much into what I said earlier about liquids. So get used to using liquids as part of your armoury as well as boilies and also understand that as we get into early spring, carp then become pre-spawning animals and they're looking for mineral supplements to get them ready for spawning. And it's too long a subject to go on about now, but they are saline animals. Their body encapsulates saline, so they're looking to up their salt levels. So think clearly about where you fish, how you fish, and try to give them something that they need as opposed to something that you think they'll want. That's the, the, the key shift. Look for something they need, not something they want, and keep going fishing. Sounds good to me. Well, I've, I've learned plenty even off camera as well from you. So uh, it's been enjoyable to be with you. I hope this session turns out good for you. I'm sure uh, you'll keep me posted if you do. And for the rest of the season, I hope everything goes good for you as well. I'm sure I'll see you again. But uh, thanks for having me along. And uh, cheers for watching, everyone. Brilliant. Enjoyed it, Joe. You take care, buddy. <laughs>